Good morning. I'm hoping I'm going to get a friendlier reception than the last time I addressed an audience like this in Barcelona. This is the most attractive, the most beautiful place I've ever had the privilege to lecture, so it's a particular pleasure to be here today. That's not Barcelona. Um, it's Venice. And for sure, the camera has played a trick. It's exaggerated, that sense. But that is the dominance of tourism over the local community. And that's what increasingly people are feeling about tourism. That's what they feel when they see it. So what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to talk about the problem. I'm going to talk about the relationship between sustainability and competitiveness. And I should thank Martin for the prominence of this in my mind. He's the first person who drew this to my attention. I'm going to look at some of the causes of over-tourism. Then I'm going to look at the symptoms and then look at some solutions. But I'm going to talk first uh, about the problem and I just want to make a few points about tourism before we get into the problem of over-tourism. The first thing it seems to me to say about tourism is that it isn't in any way a natural phenomenon. It's a social activity. Tourism will be what we make it, both as providers through business, through cities, and as consumers. It is the product of our social activity, which means we have every opportunity to change it. It's fundamentally a social construct. The other point I wanted to make is that I so often hear tourism professionals talk about the importance of access, that they want tourists to be able to arrive more and more easily. It is also important to remember that if they can arrive easily, they can leave easily too. And we're seeing, in general, a reduction in length of stay in many destinations around the world because of the ease of access, which the industry has campaigned for, forgetting that access equals egress and that people can leave just as quickly. So many cities are growing rapidly at the moment because of long weekend tourism experiences. That may or may not be desirable. But when you're arguing for more access, remember that more access means more egress as well. The other point I want to make is that mass tourism, not tourism itself, but mass tourism, is a relatively recent phenomenon and that it's very much a product of the age of oil. I see no sign at all of tourism reducing um, in the rest of my lifetime. But that doesn't mean that for the rest of our species' existence on this planet, tourism will continue to grow. That may not be the case. I don't think it's going to decline in any way at all in the short term. It's going to continue to grow. But we shouldn't assume that tourism will always be around as a major source of income for cities. The other point I want to make is very obvious, but often forgotten, which is that the metrics matter. The way in which you judge the success of a destination has for, in my view, for far too long been judged by the number of international arrivals. And clearly, if you're the Minister of Finance in a country, that is probably what matters most, because it's the foreign exchange earnings that obsess you. But the reality is that we ought to be looking at length of stay, and particularly yield. How much money is being spent and how much profit and wages are being in the local economy as a consequence of the tourism. And there's, in my view, too little attention paid to that. But the fundamental political question, it seems to me, is, is a destination going to use tourism or is it going to be used by it? And that's very much what the conference we held here six years ago was about. Is, is Barcelona going to use tourism or, as I saw it at that time, is, is tourism going to continue to use Barcelona? And in my view, the balance has shifted significantly in that six years. And that's one of the reasons that people are looking to Barcelona to see what the future holds for other destinations. Now, probably 
the city which is most closely following Barcelona is Amsterdam. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But I wanted, first of all, to talk about this word over-tourism, which everybody hates. But the word has taken root. It's not going to go away. I go to many destinations. In fact, I, we ran a conference in Ireland two years ago, and the government made very clear that if we used the word over-tourism, we weren't welcome and the conference wasn't going to happen. That hasn't stopped people applying the word over-tourism to Ireland. You can't just hide away, not use the word yourself, and hope that others won't use it of you. The reality is that that word is out there. And it's out there because of these kinds of images. Now, most of those are of Venice, so that's okay. But the bottom right is, of course, um, the Rambler. The truth is, over-tourism is the antithesis of responsible tourism. And I spent 20 years trying to convince people to be interested in responsible tourism. In the last three years, interest in over-tourism makes it very easy now to get people to pay attention. Because in some ways, the problem we have with over-tourism is a consequence of not having taken sustainability and durability seriously enough in the past. We're now having to repair the damage which has been done by paying no more than lip service. So over-tourism occurs widely in lots of different places, but it appears in different ways. The only two really global problems are carbon emissions and plastics. The other emissions, the other pollutions are mostly local in their impact. And over-tourism is always local, with particular local causes and particular characteristics. Responsible tourism is about making better places for people to live in, recognising that great places to live are great places to visit, and that places belong to the people who live there. The photograph in the top left is of the top of Mount Snowdon in Wales. Um, can you imagine? You climb all the way up that mountain to find a whole lot more people got there by train, and now you've got a queue to get your selfie on the peak of Stoughton. I mean, what a great day out uh, in Wales. There are lots of other mountains in Wales which you could climb and which luckily don't have railways and don't have large numbers of people. The growth in the use of the word over-tourism is frightening. Um, this is a, a slide I looked at Scotland rather than looking at Barcelona, but you can see even on Google Scholar, 523 references to over-tourism in Scotland, uh, sorry, to over-tourism, and 51 to over-tourism in Scotland. We'll see that grow very rapidly, but 596,000 references to over-tourism on Google um, just last week. Now, of course, in some places we want to see crowds. This is Petticoat Lane in London. A street market wouldn't be a lot of fun if it wasn't crowded. We want those places to be crowded, but we want to see locals there as well as tourists. And one of the problems on the Rambler is that more and more tourists are saying they haven't met anybody from Barcelona on the Rambler, which takes away from the experience of the place. I was there last night and disappointed to see the complete dominance, really, of stalls favouring marketing to tourists and not to locals feels like a space now that belongs to tourists and not to locals. Again, mostly of Barcelona. And of course, on the left, those, those two slides there, if you're a certain age and looking for a mate, going to a crowded beach with lots of people with not too many clothes on can be an attractive experience. It's not without a place in, in the market. But the reality is um, that being in Venice or, Wentz, or Old Town Square, that's the the one on the right there. And of course, that advertisement from Cricketer Holidays, and I in no way um, think badly of Cricketer Holidays, it's a great company. They were just very honest. Whenever a place gets spoilt, we move on. We don't market it anymore. We look for other destinations. So, over-tourism basically describes destinations where hosts or guests feel that the place has too many tourists, that the quality of life in the area or the quality of the experience for the, for the guest has deteriorated unacceptably. And that often happens concurrently. 
the problems you've had in Barcelona are not just problems with the local community. Tourists themselves are reporting that they feel that some parts of the city are over-touristed and that it's lost quality as a consequence. So let's go to Amsterdam rather than take the risk of talking about Barcelona. Amsterdam is now moving the I am Amsterdam because it's created an attraction, an over-touristed attraction, which they don't want to have there. They're beginning to crack down on alcohol and unacceptable behaviour. Launched a campaign against inappropriate behaviour from tourists and they've increased police activity. Seems to me to be entirely sensible. Now this you don't control. This is uh, a, an online community of travellers giving recommendations to each other about where to go to. You don't have any control over this as a tour operator or as a city. But you can see it. Can Amsterdam be saved from over-tourism? It's an open question. But that doesn't do Amsterdam any good. And as I say, none of you control that. That social media content is not within your control. Now, I should say, all of the photographs from here on in are actually taken from the newspapers. They're not my photographs. They're the photographs which newspapers have chosen to use to present Amsterdam. Now, it seems to me that that particular image will probably put off more people than it attracts. I've had the misfortune to stand in Schiphol um, watching the hen parties and the stag parties coming through on a Friday night frankly already drunk when they get off the plane. So they're not even consuming the alcohol in Amsterdam. Amsterdam has now put a tax on visitors coming off the boats and they've lost some boats as a result. But they've improved tourism in the city. Eight euros per passenger now being charged for every disembarking passenger into Amsterdam. This is Florence, it's not Amsterdam, but there they've resorted to hosing down the steps to prevent tourists eating their picnics on the steps of the churches and leaving behind the litter and the grease and the other debris that people eating picnics tend to leave behind. That's um, received a mixed response in Europe, but those are the kinds of images which are being used to describe it. This is the Daily Telegraph tourism taking over, and then, of course, the seven best alternatives to overcrowded Amsterdam becomes the lead. And unfortunately, these stories are not in the travel pages. These are in the, the feature pages. So even people not looking for holidays are seeing these stories about Amsterdam. And then on the right, Amsterdam being uncreated by mass tourism, and that's in The Guardian. This isn't doing these destinations any favours. And then 10 destinations to stay away from. That's also unhelpful. So, sustainability and competitiveness. Barcelona has been an extremely competitive destination now for many years. It's been very successful. The problem is that we've had 40 years now, 45 years, since the first UN conference on man and the environment in, in 1972. And we pretty much continued with business as usual, not just in tourism, but in general. We haven't made the situation better because although we've taken some action, the problems created by growth have been greater in that period than the reduction in the problem by the action we've taken. So effectively, we're now bumping up against the limits to growth. Now, you may object that there are no limits to the number of people that Barcelona Barcelona can absorb, but it seems to me you only have to accept the fact that there is not infinite capacity for tourism in Barcelona to recognise that there must be a limit somewhere. You may want to argue about what the limit is, but that there is a natural limit to the number of tourists who come to Barcelona seems to me to be unquestionable. And, of course, as you bump up against the limits to growth, you begin to get social and economic conflict around the activities which are causing the problem you reach the limits of acceptable change and people begin to push back. And that's what happened in the run-up to the election in 2015. Now, this is a, a quote which, it interests me. I'm the only academic that uses it. Um, but it does seem to me to be one of the most important things said about tourism 
in the recent past. And it's from Sir Colin Marshall when he was chair of British Airways. And he said it when he was opening the Tourism for Tomorrow Awards, the first one in 1994, the first of the BA ones in 1994. But he said, and this is often quoted, that these tourism products must be kept fresh and unsullied, not just for the next day, but for every tomorrow. You see that periodically quoted. What you don't see is what he said before, which is, I think, the more important part of that quotation, when he said that travel, tourism and the travel industry is essentially the renting out for short-term lets of other people's environments. And that immediately raises the question of who Barcelona belongs to. Does Barcelona belong to the industry? Which, the last time I spoke to the industry in Barcelona, was very clear that the industry took the view that Barcelona belonged to the industry? Or does Barcelona belong to the residents and the citizens of Barcelona who pay for the maintenance of the public spaces and the social resources which are used by tourism? It seems to me it's unquestionably the case that Barcelona belongs to the people, the citizens of this city. So, the kind of academic theory of this is really around the tragedy of the commons that public realm goods and most tourism assets in a city are public realm goods. They're non-rival goods, so people, any number of people can come and consume them at the same time. It doesn't stop other people consuming them at the same time, but it reduces the quality of the experience. So, lots of people on the Ramblers last night, and I was there, like everybody else, contributing to the problem. Um, but my experience of the Rambler was less good than it was six years ago, when I, or seven years ago, when I first experienced it. And part of the problem is that we can't exclude others. Nowhere has infinite capacity. At some point, everywhere bumps up against these limits. And tourist activity and behaviours affect the capacity, which is why in Amsterdam you see a lot of effort has gone into changing the rules around the guiding of groups about what, uh, what facilities can be sold, so they've stopped the segways and they've stopped the beer bikes in Amsterdam. That's one of the ways in which you can increase capacity. But fundamentally the problem is that we believe that we have the right to increase our herd, to increase our use of the space in a world that is limited. And each of us in the industry, by pursuing our own best interest in a society that believes in the freedom of the commons, makes the problem worse, and that's the tragedy. Which means, in my view, effectively only an administrative system managed politically can have any chance of restricting or managing growth in a way that enables everyone to make the best of a difficult situation. And that is to balance the interests of the citizens, the children, the, the local visitors, the domestic tourists, and the international visitors. Only a system overseen by a political administration can hope to do that. So what are the causes? The proximate causes are always locally apparent. It's a consequence of the volume, the behavior, and the impacts of the tourists and the businesses, the tourism industry, in the destination. It's different in different places. It follows from that that the solutions will be different in different places too. We know that there's a very high propensity to consume travel as people get wealthier. And we're going to see a massive increase in the amount of travel coming from, um, from Asia, from China and India in particular, but from the whole of Asia. We know that um, the cost of travel, untaxed as it is, means that it remains relatively cheaper than other forms of activity. You know, it's cheaper for me to fly than it is to use my car per mile travelled. If, as long as that remains the case, people will continue to fly and they'll continue to take multiple short breaks, which they will enjoy, as I do. Whether that's a good thing is a different matter. We've also, of course, seen disintermediation and the growth of, of P2P platforms. That's not going to go away. Some places are more effective in regulating them. I point out Amsterdam has just reduced the number of days that an Airbnb business can be let from... 90 to 60 days. So they've gone lower, I think, than Barcelona in terms of how, how long you're allowed to do it. And they've done an agreement with Airbnb to police that. 
The public realm is free, and of course, many of the experiences that people want are the trophy photos. So you go to the Sacra Familia, and a lot of people go in, but it's a lot more people who go and just get their photograph by the Sacra Familia. That's all they need. When Martin and I were in Venice, somewhere around 10% of all the tourists of Venice go into the Doge's Palace. The rest don't. They simply enjoy the public space and get their trophy photo and go away, and they've experienced Venice, they think. Dispersal, great strategy, but of course that can be intrusive if it's sending people into more residential areas where people don't want to see tourists. In some ways, tourists are like weeds. They're fine if they're in the right place, but when they get in the wrong place, you see them as a weed rather than something desirable. Seasonality may actually be a good thing. The person showing me round last night was saying that they, by the end of April, where they were taking me last night, they're not going back, and they won't go back until the worst of the tourism passes. So the seasonality gives respite as well for local communities to enjoy assets which they don't enjoy when it's busy. Employment is seen as poor quality. I don't share that view of, of employment in travel and tourism, but the industry has been really bad at making the case for the value of jobs in in tourism and that's something which could be addressed by the industry if it was sufficiently concerned to do it honeypots are difficult to demarket it's very hard to imagine someone coming to Barcelona for the first time and not wanting to visit um, Park Guell or, or uh, the Sacra Familia and of course we're getting larger scale transport all the time so the tourists are arriving in larger numbers and that's part of the problem about cruise tourism as they flood off the boats in the morning so what are the symptoms the first thing to say, I think, is that residents and visitors are not homogenous. They will have different responses. They won't respond. There'll be differences of view amongst citizens. There are differences of view between the visitors. Crowding is perceived differently by nationality and culture. Some, if you watch, if you stand and watch, some cultures deliberately want to get uh, people into the photograph and they'll pull together a big group to get them in the photograph. Others, if you watch Europeans and Americans, very often want the illusion of wilderness. They'll spend ages waiting to get that shot without another tourist in it. There are differences there that matter. Crowds can be part of the experience, as I demonstrated with the beach and with um, Petticoat Lane. There are no-go zones for tourists, and I have to tell you that that's the kind of language being used about parts of Barcelona now in the media. People are talking about there being no-go zones for locals. There's a ratchet effect. I was last in Prague in 1988 and decided then, and this is after all, it's before the wall came down, I decided then that I probably wasn't going to go back to Prague because I wanted to remember the way it was before it got flooded by tourists. I was meeting in 88, I was meeting too many Americans and too few Czechs. Tourism is arriving in bigger groups, in cruise lines and bigger coaches. We've got tourismophobia, um, which I think more has been made of by the industry trying to defend itself than is realistic. I don't think tourismophobia is that big a deal. We get trampling and litter. We get loss of housing stock. And, and Barcelona, I think, is clearly in the lead on this. Regulatory lag is a big problem. The cities don't move as fast as the industry, and, and therefore there is regulatory lag, but in Barcelona it's catching up. And the locals are being excluded socially and economically in more and more destinations. The tourists can appear like weeds or they can be the most beautiful flowers. It depends where they are and what they're doing and whether you want them to be there. This is Krakow. I'm very fond of Krakow. I think it's one of the world's great cultural cities. They have the really serious misfortune at the moment. That, and that's a genuine advert. I didn't make this up. It's a genuine advertisement. Go to these beautiful cities because the beer is cheap. Who wants to be marketed like that? And then I discovered, because I thought I'd have a look, the cheapest place to get drunk in Europe is Krakow. It's the cheapest beer. So if you want a good stag party and drink lots of beer, go to Krakow. Poor Krakow. Fancy being marketed like that. So whose responsibility is it to do something about this? The world is finite. There are no infinite destinations. So what do we do? The first thing, I think, is that it cannot be done by any one stakeholder. In Barcelona, I'm really looking forward to, to being there tonight at the Tourism Council meeting. Barcelona has really pioneered the multi-stakeholder approach. 
If you look at the policies that are available, I personally would like to see carbon taxes beat me up afterwards, but there we go. I would like to see them. I think they're inevitable. They will happen. It's only a matter of when. Politically, cities need to decide to use tourism rather than to be used by it. We need to change the KPIs for marketing organisations, and they'll hate it, but we need to change it. We need to make sure that the marketing organisations are seeking to attract visitors who will spend significant amounts of money and who will stay for a while. We need to measure the performance in different ways. It's no longer acceptable just to judge marketing organisations by the number of arrivals. We need to attempt to attract tourists who will fit in. And Amsterdam is working really hard at shifting its base back to the kinds of people who enjoy a cultural city and a cultural experience. We need to separate the marketing and management functions, and Barcelona has been very quick to do that. They've done it in a very interesting way, I think. We need to regulate housing markets through the planning system and through the housing policy of cities. We need tourism taxes. We need preferential access to resources for, for residents. We need evidence-based management, and that's one of the areas where Barcelona is streets ahead, really streets ahead of anywhere else, is in sharing the evidence base to inform decision-making about the scale and impacts of tourism. And we need to ensure that locals benefit. Now, if you move on, that's obviously Barcelona, and to some extent it describes the problem, but you'll all have seen that graphic before. When I show that in other cities, people are amazed that as easily as using Instagram, you could work out where these hotspots are. So what can happen on the supply side? You can regulate both licensed and unlicensed accommodation, and you can use the planning system and building regulations to avoid tourism ghettos and the oversupply of accommodation. What's happened in some European cities is that when they get an oversupply, particularly at weekends, they get into attracting um, stag parties and hen parties which is actually a downward spiral and it's very difficult to come back. You can regulate the disintermediated accommodation and transport, and I know you've banned Uber in this city and you're doing a lot to regulate accommodation. You can attempt to distribute tourism more evenly, and you've, you've done quite a lot of that. You can reroute and increase the supply of public transport, which I know you've been doing around the Sacra Familia and, and Park Royal. When I did some work for um, Visit England five years ago now, I was asked to meet with a whole lot of people who were supposedly interested in sustainable tourism. The only thing that they could identify which had been done in Britain to make tourism more sustainable was park and ride and pedestrianisation, none of which was done for tourism. That was all done to make the lives of residents better. As it happens, it also makes the lives of tourism better, of tourists. But that wasn't why it was done. You can cap arrivals. Nice idea. You can close, as they have in Thailand. They've closed some beaches to enable them to recover. You can harden sites. You can make them more durable and help them to cope with large numbers of visitors. It works very well in natural areas. Um, and you can introduce time tickets and dynamic pricing. And again, Barcelona is probably in the lead as a city in doing that. So, on the demand side... You can ask the question, whose responsibility is it to fill beds? And Barcelona, I think, has an honourable tradition of not just giving in to the hotels and putting on events to fill hotels. Other cities have very much fallen into that trap, but you haven't done that here. I think things like this are brilliant, in enlisting the assistance of the visitors in not staying on licensed accommodation. But effectively, demarketing, Kotler, the god of tourism, the of marketing theory, not just tourism, but marketing theory, 1971 was his first work on demarketing. It's not a new idea. It's been around a while. It works very effectively if it's used to deter particular market segments or to reduce demand. You can change the destination image to attract more compatible market segments, and that's what Amsterdam is doing right now. You can use marketing and regulation to change behaviour. You can tell people that drunken tourists are not welcome in Amsterdam, and eventually they'll get the message. You can introduce tourist taxes, and of course visa charges amount to a tourist tax as well. In terms of managing activities and behaviour, you can, as you have in Barcelona, keep the pavements clear. You can control parking. In Amsterdam, they banned segways and beer trains. You can hose down church steps, as I showed you earlier. 
You can control the location of shops and the retail offer through the planning system. In the Gambia now, they've introduced tourism courts so that um, tourists who break the rules and the tourism businesses and informal guides who break the rules get very quick justice. And you can bring temporal and spatial distribution. What you can't control is that photograph on the right. It's unfortunate for Barcelona that there was a social activist passing by who took that photograph. But that flashed around the world, and that's the kind of image you don't forget. I can't imagine there's anyone in this room who's not seen that image before. And if you're really good, as Barcelona is, you can win a world award in responsible tourism. Thank you for listening. I don't know if it's sustainable or not, but incredibly, we have saved time this morning. And we have the opportunity to take advantage of the presence of Halo here for some questions, some reflections, some um, that you want. Teniu la paraula si voleu aprofitar el temps que ens ha sobrat, perquè és increïble, però anem bé de temps. It's worth reflecting that this time nobody has walked out. <laughs> Lalena. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Mr. Goodwin. It's uh, Elena Foget from Value Retail. Um, you mentioned that the metrics are important to change uh, the approach how sustainable tourism can be more relevant and dominant in terms of uh, conscious across all the markets and institutions and private also companies. And what we need to do together, private and public sector, to change the metrics and the ranking and the KPIs. And instead of uh, just using arrivals, use qualitative metrics. What's the step that we need to do to immediately change the way we measure? I know that there's a discussion going on at the moment about what the sustainable marketing of tourism means. How would you identify what that is. And it seems to me that the, the way you do that is to decide what your objectives are, which are presumably already um, decided in the sense that you have a management strategy for sustainable tourism now in Barcelona and a very sophisticated and developed one. It seems to me that, that if, if marketing is a function of management, and that was my point about DMOs, in the past DMOs became destination marketing organizations and that's all they did. They forgot that actually marketing is supposed to be a function of a broader management approach. So if marketing is a functional tool which you use within a general management strategy, then it seems to me that you would use your marketing to deliver what you're wanting to do with your destination management plan. Now explicitly on the economic side, that would mean, for example, as Amsterdam is doing, that they are deliberately discuss discouraging um, hen and stag parties, and they're doing that with the communication strategy. They're stopping large groups of people assembling around the sex workers. There's a very interesting piece from the mayor of um, Amsterdam arguing that women, men and women working in the sex trade were entitled to a dignity of labour, um, and therefore they're not in themselves a tourist attraction. They shouldn't be seen in that way. They're people employed in a trade and they shouldn't be seen as, as, as a tourist attraction. So there are things you can do in that way which are very qualitative in changing it and stopping the beer, just banning the beer trains, which were a dreadful innovation. Very simple to do. Uh, it's not simply a regulatory thing. But you were asking about the marketing, and it seems to me that what you have to do is to give your marketeers, and marketeers are generally very clever people, you need to give them different targets. So the best example is probably New Zealand, um, which for a period of about five years had a destination marketing strategy that said four things. We want this number of international visitors to end up in these parts of New Zealand. 
You sort out how you're going to do that, but that's the test. Can you get international visitors to these areas? And it was five or six percent. They weren't incredibly difficult targets, but of course, once you start that process, you can increase those numbers. The second thing we want is that we want people who are going to stay and contribute quite a lot while they're here, because we know New Zealand is remote and probably most people will only come once in a lifetime. The third thing we want is people who are going to fit in and who want, want to spend on things which already exist in New Zealand. They're going to want to eat in local restaurants, they're going to want to have uh, sporting and other activities which already exist. So we're adding revenue to existing businesses rather than having to invest all the time in new businesses and create new attractions. And the fourth thing we want is people who are going to be compatible with the destination. So don't come if you're not interested in rugby union. Sorry, I'm in Spain. Rugby union is a passion in New Zealand small towns. Um, and it's one, of the, it's one of the reasons they have such a great international side is that everybody's obsessed by rugby or cricket. So if you bring those kinds of people, they will go home and, and encourage their friends to come and then you've got a virtuous circle because it's people who know what, what New Zealand is and they'll go home and market to their friends who will also come and have a good time in New Zealand. But you need to set your own targets because every destination is different and the aspirations of every destination are different. But that's the kind of thing you need to do. Um, Harold, uh, reference to the metrics question you've just been asked. Do you think, given that uh, residents in responsible tourism play such an important part, that actually the metrics that you're making should include the measurement of the satisfaction of residents of tourism yeah. uh, through surveys and so on. Martin, thank you for reminding me of that because I was talking very much about what the marketing organisation might do. But one of the things that people recognise about Barcelona and the, the richness of the observatory here and what's available is the regular polling of opinion amongst the citizens about tourism and having that data down district by district means that you can make a much more sophisticated judgment and a much more sophisticated management. The other thing I'd say, which wasn't going to be part of the presentation, but in a way it arises out of this, Martin. I've worked a lot in Kerala, which some of you know, and here. What's interesting about the similarities between Kerala and here, and Kerala has a different problem about over-tourism. Um, which was in a way more serious than the problem here because when we ran the conference there in 2008 there was actually a demonstration against the mere holding of the conference. We had a march um, come to the gates of the conference in, in anger that we would dare to talk about anything called responsible tourism. I mean they simply took the view that this was impossible and all tourism was the work of the devil. Um, but they've turned that round as well by addressing the local concerns about tourism. But what Barcelona and Kerala both have in common are very high rates of literacy and very high levels of local democratic participation. And I'm really interested this evening to, to visit the Tourism Council for the first time and see that kind of civic action. I've seen it many times in Kerala, but it does seem to me that the creation of the kinds of multi-stakeholder partnerships which are necessary to manage tourism in a city or in a rural area as it is in Kerala, turns upon being able to get a basis of agreement and a consensus amongst a lot of different stakeholders. And that's just easier if you've got well-developed democratic traditions as you do have here. I am Chiara De Bernardi from Esadi Business School. Uh, so I have a question about thinking about an entrepreneurial perspective and thinking about this context of over tourism like Barcelona or Venice. Which are the um, areas where an entrepreneur uh, that starts to, to have like an enterprise do you think should focus more thinking about this uh, over tourist context from an entrepreneurial perspective? That's a big question. Um, 
I'm not sure that for the individual entrepreneur, if we're talking about the small entrepreneurs rather than the big aggregators, that it makes that much difference. I mean, I, I would have thought that, that for any entrepreneur opening up a restaurant in Barcelona, um, there's a lot to be said for making sure that you've got a stronger local market, by which I mean within your area, a, a stronger city market, which means you might be attracting people from within the city, and that you add to that some tourist dimension. I mean, if you really want to have a business which is dependent only upon tourists, feel free, but that must surely be a less secure base than a business which is drawing on a number of different market segments. Yeah? So it, it, it seems to me it's a matter of balancing within your own individual business the, the kinds of people who you are attracting. And maybe you attract different people at different times of the day, which seems to me as I walk around Barcelona fairly obvious at lunchtime there's a lot of workers having lunch in, in, in the city. In the evenings, many of them have gone home or are eating in different kinds of restaurants and they become rather more used by tourists. I think it's a matter of the fundamental principle of, of sustainability is, is always to have as many sources of market as are compatible. And what we know in, for sure is that, and this is very evident from um, even in America, which always surprises me, but in America now, the latest research amongst the younger travelers, and by that I mean people under 35, is that they are, just as in Europe, much more focused on experiences that it's the experience they want. And there's a whole series of films which luckily have now been taken down, um, which were on the, um, the BBC World Service travel website. About four of them, um, where the reporter had been doing interviews, Vox Pop interviews with tourists on the, on the Rambler, and everybody was saying the same thing. We can't find anybody from Barcelona here on the Rambler. What's the point of being here? I didn't, I didn't come to Barcelona to meet some other Australians. You know, I came to Barcelona to meet some people from Barcelona. And I think that is a challenge. I was taken um, last night to four different uh, craft beer outlets, two of which I will never go back to because they're clearly designed for tourists. Robin really made a mistake doing that with me last night. Uh, two of which were superb because they were um, a mix of tourists and locals. And, and people wanting an experience in Barcelona want to go somewhere where there are local people as well. They don't want to go to a tourist ghetto. Or the number of people who want to go to a tourist ghetto as a proportion of the total number of visitors is reducing. Hello, Harold. Hi, Paloma Zapata from Sustainable Travel. Um, my question is about a resident benefits, economic benefits, and the peer-to-peer. -peer. So you talk about creating benefits for the locals, but also talk about the issues of peer-to-peer -peer being blamed for gentrification and for over-tourism. Um, so my question is, where is there a balance, for example, it was created peer-to-peer -to, -peer to actually allow people to reap the benefits of tourism of that economic activity or actually to bring people out of the center and actually bring them to your neighborhoods. So what, what are your thoughts as far as where can we balance? Well, I, I, th I think the first thing to say is that peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer websites weren't set up to benefit local people. They may have done that, but that wasn't the business motivation between creating them. Um, even Airbnb, which had a quite alternative radical origin has very quickly changed its character. Um, and that doesn't mean that I'm opposed to peer-to-peer. -peer. I think it's a desirable thing. But the problem is that it's a bit like when somebody, um, when somebody sells their, their house, somebody in a village sells their house to an incomer, somebody who's going to come into that village. They feel great. It's wonderful that the price of their house has gone up. But of course it means that other people in that village now have fewer houses from which their children can select where they might live. So there are winners and losers in the local community. It's not a simple matter. And again, we come back to this problem of balance. Now, what's happened in many cities, but unfortunately not in London, is that people are beginning to regulate the number of days that an Airbnb um, can provide accommodation for tourists. And that at least begins to balance it back. Now, I think it's still 90 days in Barcelona. As I said, in Amsterdam, it's 60. And that's a way in which you could change 
the balance. And again, that affects who's benefiting. But it won't be the poorest people in Barcelona who are able to let their properties on Airbnb. It will be the relatively wealthier. They may not be wealthy, but they'll be wealthier than the poorest people in Barcelona who are able to do that. So I don't think there are simple answers to this question. And I think we should remember that accommodation is not the only way in which people can benefit from tourism. I was fascinated, and I don't know much about it, but to hear about the check-in tax, which the, one of the apartment associations has now introduced. That's another example of the way in which tourism can be put back in the local community. Apex Hotels, which I, who I don't think are in Barcelona, but they do office block conversions into hotels, and they put a big effort into providing community facilities for their neighbours when they do those conversions of, of office blocks into hotels. So there's a whole lot of ways in which it can be done. Airbnb is not the only way in which local communities can benefit from tourism. And I would argue that there are big disadvantages for local communities in Airbnb as well as advantages, as we saw with the photograph and bus on the letter. Ah, yes. Good morning. Um, what we call Destination Barcelona, which is the city and the region, um, is a way of managing um, the, real, the real experience area where tourists um, stays. When, regarding your solutions, coming back to the policy matters, um, I wonder if uh, this strategy of collaboration between the region and the city could be one of the most relevant or not aspects of the solutions. Thank you, Harold. I, I, I think it can, but I have one, one really big doubt about it, which is if you've got, I forget what the average length of stay in Amsterdam is, but I think it's quite short, isn't it? About three days? So you think what somebody's going to do if they're here for three days. Repeat visitors may be different, but the first time visitor here for three days, you're not going to get them out of the city very much because there are so many honeypot destinations. I once, um, I used to run incoming tours to London and I had a bunch of Polish apple growers come in and the three things that they wanted to do in my city, a city of which I'm very proud, so don't misunderstand this, but they wanted to go and see Buddy Holly, which has got nothing to do with Britain, so I've had to sit through Buddy Holly. They wanted to go for a meal in Chinatown, which is a great experience, but it's nothing to do with London. And they wanted, and this is the really bad bit, they wanted to go to the Trocadero Center on Piccadilly. Now the Trocadero Center at that time was selling the cheapest, nastiest, imported rubbish pieces of souvenir. And when I asked them, and this is the frightening bit for you as well, when I asked them, why on earth do you want to go to the Trocadero Center? They said, because our friends won't believe we've been to Barcelona if we don't come back with something from the... Sorry, haven't been to London. If we don't come back with something from the Trocadero Centre. Which is horrendous. Um, so I think there's a problem about encouraging people, if they've only got two or three days, to, to not go to the honeypots and go somewhere else. Amsterdam is very um, cleverly... I've forgotten the name of the place in Dutch, but they've renamed the local beach resort as Amsterdam by sea, which is quite a smart thing. And they've extended the metro, so now you can get out there very quickly by metro. Your problem is you have a perfectly fine beach in the city already. People don't need to go out of the city to get to the beach, and, and that's part of the problem, isn't it? Down at Barcelona Letta and along the seafront, there's already a lot of tourists there. That's what I mean. Every solution will be different in different cities, and distribution and encouraging people to go out way is very important, but you need to reckon, remember that for first-time visitors... And also, actually, for me, and I've been, what, I don't know, 10, 12 times to Barcelona, there are still places I want to go back to every time, including, ironically, the Rambler, um, which is not great. I'm really embarrassed now that I went to the Rambler last night, but I'm going to be dishonest and say I didn't go there. I did. Um, so that re the repeat visitor problem, where you've got reduced length of stay, will make the development of these other places more difficult, which is why I think you... Our whole emphasis in travel and tourism needs to be on getting people to go for a bit longer. And carbon taxes would help with that. I don't see another hand. I think we may have exhausted questions. 
Thank you very much. It's been a privilege to be here today.